Hi, in this video I am going to discuss Edexcel IAL Unit 5 Physics Paper, May June 2022. Okay, question number one. The luminosity axis of Hertzsprung Russell diagram has a longitudinal scale. Which of the following is the reason for that? Uh, you know, normally the HR diagram, Hertzsprung Russell diagram, when we draw the y axis is relative luminosity, L over L naught, and x axis is the time in Kelvin. Uh, normally it starts from higher to lower, start from higher, then it decreases along the in, uh, time axis and the value decreases. So if it is 40,000, the initial temperature, then we mark it 20,000 with the same ratio that is normally half. Then this is 10,000, 5,000 and 2,500. Okay, so if the same scale is drawn in logarithmic scale, same graph is drawn in logarithmic scale, it will become log 40,000 will become 4.60 and 2500 logarithmic scale uh, log 2500 will become 3.30 so the advantage here when you are drawing in temperature Kelvin scale the range is very large from 2500 to 40,000 you need to scale the x-axis it's very difficult but when you draw the same temperature in logarithmic scale, the range will be just from 3.30 to 4.60, a smaller range. So that will be easy to scale it, easy to scale the x-axis. So the answer for question number one is B, the range of luminosities of stars is very large. So that's the reason, larger range. To reduce the larger range into smaller range, we normally take logarithmic scale. So correct answer for question number one is B. Right, question, num question number two. A mass is hung from a spring and set into vertical oscillation. The mass is then changed so that the frequency of oscillation doubled. So frequency becomes double, same spring, means same spring constant k. Yeah, the uh, spring constant is same k, but only the mass is changed, so the new frequency becomes double. The amplitude of oscillation has no change, so it remains the same. So which of the following quantities is also doubled? Okay, you know that uh, the time period for spring mass system is given by t equal to 2 pi square root of m over k. And we know that frequency equal 1 over t, so that will be 1 over t, that means 1 over 2 pi square root of k over m. So same spring, same k, but now the frequency has become 4 times means the mass, the new mass has become, I can call the new mass M1, has become one fourth of the earlier mass. So if you substitute here M by 4, you know 4 will go up, square root, the 4 will come out, it will become 2 times the same quantity, it will become 2F. So the mass has become one fourth of the earlier one, right? That's the reason frequency is becoming double. No change in K, no change in amplitude. So the first answer A, maximum acceleration of the mass, will it become double? Okay, we'll see. So answer A when we consider, we know that maximum acceleration A max equal omega squared A, A stands for amplitude, omega equal 2 pi F, we know that. So 2 pi F all the squared times A, so frequency becomes double square, that will become four times. So the new acceleration, the maximum acceleration will become four times of the earlier one because frequency becomes double, right? So square of the, uh, the square of the double is four times. So acceleration, maximum acceleration will become four times of the earlier. So that is not the answer. So B part maximum kinetic energy of the mass C part maximum velocity of the mass. So I feel better to check 
what will happen to the maximum velocity then we will think about maximum kinetic energy because you know that maximum kinetic energy is given by half m v max square so better we will analyze what will happen to the maximum velocity then we will think about uh, what will happen to the kinetic energy maximum kinetic energy we know that v max equal a omega omega equal 2 pi f so into 2 pi f right now when the frequency become double amplitude has no change so v max will become double that's a question v max will become double that's a question so v max becomes double means uh, the answer for question number two is c then what will happen to the kinetic energy so the kinetic energy the new kinetic energy maximum if i call it as kinetic energy dash that's going to be half the mass is going to be one fourth of the earlier and V max becomes double so that means square of it will become four times V max square so no change in kinetic energy the kinetic energy has no change the maximum kinetic energy has no change the maximum speed will become double so 4 and 4 will get cancelled again you will get half m v max square so kinetic energy has no change it could be a new question this year which of the quantity will remain unchanged so kinetic energy will remain the same but in this question the, uh, they ask which quantity will become double so when the uh, when the frequency become double maximum velocity will become double so question number two, correct answer C. Okay, question number three, which of the following does not have the base unit per second? Angular velocity, when you think about angular velocity, we know that SI unit of angular velocity is radian per second, radian per second. But when you think about vehicle r omega, the speed is meter per second. The unit of speed is meter per second. Unit of r is meter. So the unit of omega, I use square root, uh, square bracket for unit. Unit of omega will be per second. So angular speed has base one base unit per second. So that is not the answer because they are asking which quantity has uh, uh, does not have the base unit per second. Then frequency, you know, base unit is per second, SI unit is hertz. Then redshift, redshift has no unit. Actually, this change in delta F over F, that has no unit, actually. So, correct answer for question number three is C. Question number four. A communication satellite has a mass of 0.935 kilogram. The satellite has an orbital radius four times the radius of the Earth. Which of the following gives the gravitational pull of the Earth on the satellite in orbit? So this is the Earth. The radius is R. There is a path, the orbit. So they are saying the uh, radius is 4 times the radius of the earth. So this radius is 4 arc. So I can say r1 is equal to 4 arc. Right. So which of the following gives the gravitational pull of the earth on the satellite in its orbit? Okay, so you can say that on the surface of earth, the gravitational field strain is given g equal g m over r squared, where m is the mass of the earth. Okay, on the surface of the orbit, the gravitational field strength is given by, this we know that uh, on the surface of Earth, 9.81 equal gm over r squared. So they ask you to find the gravitational pull on the uh, surface of its orbit, so that is F equal g mass of the Earth mass of the satellite over 4 r all things squared. So not a big thing, we can say this I can write g m over r squared into mass of the satellite over 16 because 4 squared is 16. g m over r squared is 9.81. Mass of the satellite is given as, uh, it's given as uh, 935. 
over 16 newton solid you will get the answer that will be 573 newton so the closer answer 570 newton answer b right question number 15 which of the uh, table gives the conditions required in the core of star for fusion to be sustained you know the density should be very high the, the hydrogen molecules should be very closer to each other to have uh, frequent collisions and temperature should be very high because the helium nuclei should have very high kinetic energy to overcome the electrostatic repulsive force so correct answer for question 5 is D question 5 correct answer D Okay, question number 6. Gravitational field strength at the surface of Earth is G. Another planet has the same density as the Earth but twice the radius of the Earth. What is the gravitational field strength at the surface of this planet? Okay, it's slightly different, nothing hard. We know that gravitational field strength is given by G equal G m over R square. R is the radius of the planet. Okay, I'll take the radius of the Earth, symbol R right so so the earth has density rho if i say but they are not giving it but they are saying it, the question is based on density so i need to replace the mass in terms of volume of the earth and the density of the earth you know volume of the earth is given by is a sphere 4 by 3 pi r cube because radius of earth i took it as r so the mass is given by density into volume so 4 by 3 pi r cube rho that's a mass so i'm going to replace this mass by this quantity so g equal g times 4 by 3 pi r cube rho over r squared so that will be r squared r will get cancelled so it will become r in the numerator 4 by 3 is a constant, pi is a constant, density, same density, so I can keep that as constant, g is constant, so it's going to be uh, 4 by 3 pi g rho into r. So the gravitational field strength, now this the whole quantity is constant, so I can say gravitational field strength is directly proportional to radius of the planet. Now the new planet, the end of the planet, which has the radius double. So when the radius become double for that planet, the gravitational field strength, if I say G1, will be equal to twice the G, where G is the field strength on the surface of Earth. So correct answer for question number 6 is B. Okay, question number 7. A fixed mass of gas occupies a constant volume. The temperature of the gas is increased. Which of the following is not true? The internal energy of the gas increases. You know, average kinetic energy of a molecule is given by half mc square. Average kinetic energy. Average half mc square. We have mean square speed. Into n is the number of molecules. This average kinetic energy of the gas. When you consider the whole gas, this is the average kinetic energy. We are, this is mean square speed, not velocity. Mean square speed, not mean square velocity. Careful. So here, mean square speed into n. So that will increase because half mc square is equal to 3 by 2 kT into n for n number of molecules. So when the temperature increases, the average kinetic energy will increase. So that is a correct statement. We need a wrong statement. So B, the mean kinetic energy of the molecules increases. Yes, that will increase. Internal energy will increase. So that internal energy means mean kinetic energy. If you cut ideal gases, they don't have potential energy. So we, uh, internal energy is the kinetic energy for ideal gases. Even for gas, we consider that's why when you are using gas equations for even real gases. The answer B, the mean kinetic energy of the molecules increases. Yes, I already drew, show that. That is a correct statement. Answer C, the mean momentum of the molecules increases. You know, the gas molecules have average 
speed, but average velocity of the gas molecules in a closed container will be equal to zero. Remember that in a closed container, when there are n number of gas molecules or gas particles or atoms, whatever it is, the average velocity of the closed container gas is equal to zero. Therefore, average mean momentum or the average momentum is given by mass times average velocity is the average momentum. But average velocity or mean velocity of the closed container, gas in a closed container is equal to zero. Therefore, average momentum or mean momentum of the gas in a closed container must be equal to zero. But if the gas is open, if, there, if the gas is flowing in a space, then the uh, velocity will not be equal to zero. But in a closed container, uh, the average velocity or the mean velocity is equal to zero. So mean momentum also zero. So it's a wrong statement. Mean momentum of the molecule increases. It's a wrong statement. It will remain zero even when the temperature is increased. So question number seven, correct answer, C. Okay, you might ask why the mean uh, velocity is zero because different gas particles will move in different directions and in case if the gas has mean velocity which is not equal to zero then the whole gas should have a displacement but the whole gas is kept inside a closed volume there is no displacement or shift in position for the whole gas individual molecules are moving that's true but different molecules are moving in different direction when you think about in terms of vectors the net displacement of the whole gas is equal to zero it's in a closed container so the mean velocity is equal to zero okay Boyle's law states question number eight Boyle's law states that under certain conditions the pressure exerted by a gas is inversely proportional to the volume occupied by the gas we know that he inversely proportional to v so we say pv equal to if i put equal sign is equal to constant and we say p1 v1 equal p2 v2 so which of the following conditions is not necessary gas must be ideal yes uh, otherwise we can't use this equation for uh, real gases even for real gases when we use the Boyle's law we assume the gas is ideal otherwise we have to do uh, correction Vandervoort corrections right so gas must be ideal is a correct statement uh, B part the B answer the mean kinetic energy of the molecules must stay constant uh, actually mean kinetic energy of the molecules stay constant means we know the mean kinetic energy already gave it half m c squared equal to 3 by 2 kt so if the mean kinetic energy wants to be constant means temperature should be constant the condition to use Boyle's law constant temperature constant mass of gas so it is a correct statement answer c the molecules in the gas must be identical no it's not necessary we don't use such uh, situation the molecules in the gas must be identical we don't consider the number of molecules answer d the number of molecules in the gas must stay constant yes that's a condition to use boils or two condition number of molecules or the amount of mass of the gas in the closed container should remain constant temperature should remain constant means mean kinetic energy should remain constant so question number eight the correct answer c okay question number nine bismuth decays to form a stable isotope of thallium which of which graph shows how the number n of the thallium atoms in the sample of bismuth varies with time so bismuth is decaying so bismuth is decaying to form thallium plus a radioactive particle we don't need to know what is it okay anyway we know that bismuth the number of molecules of the bismuth and b with time will decrease exponentially i got n equal n naught e to the power minus lambda t it will decrease exponentially so when it decreases exponentially thallium will increase in opposite way such that the total number remains almost constant when we consider this also so initially the thallium should be zero there is no thallium when this decreases it should increase so correct answer the shape 
what I drew like this shape is only one graph that is answer D. Question number nine, answer D. Okay, question number 10, a mass oscillates with simple harmonic motion. The graph shows how the velocity V varies with time T for the mass. So this velocity is given. Which graph shows how the displacement Y from the equilibrium position varies with T over the same time interval? Okay, so I'll just quickly revise. So if you are given displacement time graph, how can we sketch the velocity time graph? So if the displacement time graph is given something like this, how to draw the velocity time graph for this displacement time graph, easy way. You know the phase difference, if you differentiate uh, displacement time by time, displacement with time, you will get the velocity. The phase difference will be 90. So to get the velocity time graph, shift the y-axis towards right through t by 4. This is t, t by 4, if you shift it, the position, how it is going to start, that shows the velocity time graph. So the velocity time graph will be, nothing related to question, I'm just revising quickly. So velocity time graph will be starting like this for this graph. So the velocity time graph, if you draw for this displacement time graph, it will become this shape, one minute. Uh, so velocity time graph will be like this shape. One Shift the y-axis towards right through t by 4, you will get the velocity time graph. So the graph will be starting like this way. If I shift this y-axis towards right through t by 4, it will start like this. So the velocity time graph will be like this shape. This is the shape for velocity time graph for this displacement time graph. To get the acceleration time graph from the velocity time graph, shift the y-axis towards right again. So if you shift the y-axis towards right again to get the acceleration time graph from the velocity time graph. So if you shift, shift this through t by 4, the graph will start like this. So this is going to be the acceleration time graph. To get the acceleration time graph from displacement time graph directly, inverted the graph should be mirror image inverted this part becomes this way this part becomes this way right how to get the velocity time graph from acceleration time graph shift the y-axis towards left through t by 4 if I shift the y-axis towards left through t by 4 means the graph will start like this you can see starting like this to get the displacement time graph from velocity time graph again shift the y-axis of the velocity time graph towards left through t by 4. If I shift it through t by 4 towards left, the t by 4 part will have this shape, the graph you will get it. So easy to remember the shapes. To get velocity time graph from displacement time graph, shift the y-axis towards right through t by 4. To get the acceleration time graph from velocity time graph, shift the y-axis of the velocity time graph towards right through t by 4. To get the acceleration time graph from displacement time graph, mirror image, invert it. Other way, to get the velocity time graph from acceleration time graph, shift the y-axis towards left through t by 4, you will get the velocity time graph. To get the displacement time graph from velocity time graph, again shift this towards left through t by 4. So here velocity time graph is given. The question is, which of the graph is the displacement time graph? So velocity time graph is given, we need to get the displacement time graph, shift the graph towards left if I shift it through t by 4, that will become displacement time graph, the graph should be like this, so the graph that is starting like this, why they are using, that is the displacement time graph, which answer, that is answer A, correct answer A. Okay, section B, question number 11. A uh, standard candle in the galaxy M81 has a luminosity of 4, 14,800 times the luminosity of the sun. The intensity of radiation received from the standard candle measured at the top of the Earth's atmosphere is 3.64 10 to the power minus 7 watts per meter squared. 
calculate the distance of M81 or 8i galaxy from the Earth. The luminosity of the Sun is given as 3.83 10 to the power 26 watts. So you know the equation, simple equation, E density I equal L over 4 pi d squared given in the data sheet. So E density is given 3.64 10 to the power minus 70. We need to find the uh, distance. The luminosity is given as 14,800 times the luminosity of the sun which is all given as 3.83 10 to the power 26 watts divided by 4 pi d squared solve it and get the d 1.11 10 to the power 23 meters Okay, question number 12. Astronomers often use the unit megaparsec for astronomical distances. In a textbook, a value for the Hubble constant is given as 72 km per second per megaparsec. And so, A part, first part, show that 72 km per second megaparsec is equivalent to Hubble constant of about 2.3 10 to the power minus 18 per second and 1 megaparsec is given in terms of meter. So we can find it. Hubble constant is given as 72 kilometer per second per megaparsec. So that means 72 kilometer per second means we can say kilometer per second divided by 1 megaparsec per megaparsec that's 1 so 1 megaparsec so we'll convert it 72,000 kilometer to meter 72,000 meter per second divided by 1 megaparsec is given as 3.09 10 to the power 22 meters solid meter meter will get cancelled final answer will be with unit of per second the answer will be 2.33 2.33 into 10 to the power minus 18 per second okay second part Determine a value for the age of the universe in years. We know age of the universe is given as 1 over Hubble constant. That is 1 over H. So age of the universe equal 1 over H. That is 1 over H is 2.33 10 to the power minus 18 per second. When it goes up, it will become second. So we need to convert this into years. So that will be 18 over 2.33. So it will be second. So 10 to the power 18. Sorry, 10 to the power 18 over 2.33. Second, converting second to years. Uh, 1 year is 3.16. 10 to the power 7 seconds is given. So 3.16. 10 to the power 7 seconds is 1 year. So this much of years. So solve it. You will get age equal. Solve this. You will get 13.6. 10 to the power 9 years. That is 13.6 billion years. Okay, question number 12, part B. In the 1950s, astronomers realized that they had made an error in their determination of distances to galaxies. Galaxies are twice as far away as astronomers had previously thought. Explain how this changed, uh, uh, how this changed the age of the universe as calculated by astronomers. You know, age of the universe as we calculated in the previous part, we calculated by using Hubble's constant. 
how do we get the Hubble's constant from the Hubble's law? You know when you think about a graph, Hubble's law, V equal HD, we know the Hubble's law says V equal HD, where V is the speed of recession from Earth when we measure, speed of recession of the galaxies when we measure from Earth, D is the distance from Earth, distance of the galaxies from Earth. Okay, when you plot a graph of V against D, it will be a straight line, the best fit line. It's not a perfect straight line, but the most suitable best fit line is a straight line through the origin. So the graph will be a straight line through the origin. The gradient of this graph gives the edge. Gradient of the graph gives the edge. Okay, so in 1950s, Astronomers realized that they had made an error in their determination of distances to galaxies. That means there is no mistake in the measurement of speed of a particular galaxy. The distance has become double actually. So that means for a particular speed, say for a particular speed, if the distance is d1, now it's going to be for the same speed, it's going to be 2d1. It has become twice now. They are saying 2d1. So earlier this was the coordinate for that particular galaxy, the speed v1, the distance d1. Now there is no mistake in the measurement of speed, so speed remains the same, the distance has become 2d1. So the new coordinate will be this one. So like that, for all galaxies, they made the correction which became, which became double of the previous uh, measurement. So the new graph will be like this, this will be the new graph. So that also will pass through the origin. So you know that there is no change in this coordinate. This coordinate x axis, the x value has become double means radiant of the new graph, of the new graph, will become half of the previous graph. Previous graph h means it's going to be h by 2. The gradient is going to be half of the previous graph. Previous graph, the gradient is h. Now, after correction, the gradient becomes half means it's going to be half h. But we know that age of the universe is equal to 1 over Hubble constant. That means 1 over Hubble constant means Hubble constant is the gradient. Hubble constant is the gradient. So, it's going to be 1 over half h it's going to be, earlier it was 1 over h, now it's going to be 2 over h. That means the age becomes 2 times the age of the earlier calculation. So, age of the universe will become double, according to the new calculation, the age of the universe will become double the age of the universe but was calculated earlier. Okay, question number 13. Potassium is a radioactive isotope Potassium can decay by beta minus emission. A part complete the nuclear equation for the decay of potassium by emission of beta minus. So the equation is given. Okay, so this is the given e reaction equation. We need to complete it. Beta 0 minus 1 we must remember. So when we consider the mass number or baryon number, so this is 0, 0, 40 means this should be 40 to balance it. This should be 19. That's the answer for A part. B part. Occasionally, potassium decays by emission of positron, beta plus particle. Give two similarities between beta minus and beta plus. So, similarities both have the same magnitude of mass or same mass. Second similarity they have the same magnitude of charge. Okay, that's nothing. Now, part C. A fertilizer contains potassium chloride. The activity of a sample of the fertilizer 
due to radiative potassium was 48.6 BQ. That's the uh, activity of the sample of the uh, activity of the fertilizer due to the potassium chloride in it. It is claimed that the time T taken for the activity of the sample to fall below the background count rate would be more than 9 into 10 to the power 9 years. Deduce whether this claim is correct. So the given quantities are initial activity or the current activity is given as 48.6 BQ. I already read it. Background count rate given 0.42. How long will it take to drop to 0.42 BQ? We need to find it. Half-life is given in years. So it's not a big thing. We can to use A equal A naught A to the power minus lambda T. Lambda is not given. So we need to find the lambda by using T half equal ln 2 over lambda. From that we can find the half-life and substitute and solve it. You will get the answer. Okay, so here uh, we have first we need to find the decay constant lambda that we should find by using T half equal ln2 over lambda. So lambda equal ln2 over T half. Half-life is given in years 1.25 10 to the power 9. I can find the lambda in unit of per year. Only when we are using A equal lambda and keep the lambda in per second, then only the unit of activity will become vectoral. All other situations, we can keep the lambda any unit, any other unit, so it could be second or hour, whatever it is, but the unit of the lambda and the unit of time should be the same, same time. If you are keeping lambda in per hour, time should be in hour. When you are using n equal n naught e to the power minus lambda t, or when you are using uh, uh, a equal a dot e to the power minus lambda t. If I can keep the time in hour, then lambda should be per hour, no problem. If I keep the time in years, the lambda should be per year, no problem, we can keep it. But when we are using a equal lambda in, keep the lambda in per second, then only the unit of activity will become becquerel. Remember that. So here I'll keep the lambda in per year. When I solve this one, so lambda will be uh, 5.545 10 to the power minus 10 per year. Okay, so I'm going to use A equal A naught e to the power minus lambda t. So A naught is a given uh, that is uh, 48.6 becquerel. Uh, it should drop to the background count rate which is 0.42 becquerel. Both are becquerel, no problem. So the unit per second, per second will get cancelled. e to the power minus lambda 5.545 10 to the power minus 10 into t. So I keep this in per year, so my calculation of t will become years. You know how to solve it. Uh, simple method, you know how to solve it. Take both sides, natural logarithm, and solve it. You will get t is equal to 8.57 10 to the power 9 years. So that time is less than 9 into 10 to the power 9 years or almost equal to, uh, almost equal, we are saying it's uh, almost 9 into 10 to the power 9 years. So we are getting 8.57 10 to the power 9 years. So I can take it as almost same. If I take almost same, I can say the statement is correct. Or if I say that is less than 10 to the power 9 years, we can you should say the statement is incorrect. Either way, you can take 8.5 so almost equal to 9. If you take that is almost same, the statement is correct. But if I say this is smaller than this one, then I should say the statement is incorrect, not correct. Okay, question number 14. 
a teacher is teaching her class about the phenomenon of resonance to do this she uses a drinking glass to produce sound in two different ways when a glass is gently struck the glass emits sound for a shorter time so there's a photograph a uh, <clears throat> glass which consists of water so there is water inside so above the water there is an air column this is water the photograph is given so the glass is gently struck the glass emits sound for a short time when the wet finger is slide around the top of the glass it is possible to produce a loud continuous sound explain these observations okay so you can tell like this when you strike the glass when you when the glass is struck by gently by using a string or by using a small tin rod what happens energy is transferred and the glass water air all three together glass water air or you can say glass system will vibrate at its natural frequency and sound will be produced but if the sound won't last for longer time because when it vibrates it will dissipate the energy to the surrounding so it will lose its energy means the amplitude of the oscillation will decrease so the loudness will gradually decrease and finally it will become zero no loudness no sound but when you on the top of the glass here when on the top of the glass when you rotate by using a wet hand you can hear the sound continuously what happens there when you use a wet hand and when you slide on the top of the glass actually what happens the finger will stick and released it will be stick and released on the top of the uh, glass so that means it's like something uh, when you are playing violin by using a bow there are also the strings on the bow very soft tiny strings are there on the violin also there are strings so when you play the strings will be stick and release so that causes the string of the violin to vibrate if you put oil to the bow and play you won't get any sound because it will slip no friction so the strings of the violin will not be vibrated so here also the same principle when you rotate on the uh, when you use your finger and when you move it on top of the glass due to friction it will why it will force the glass to vibrate at a particular frequency so when the glass is forced to vibrate the whole system will vibrate at that particular frequency and glass air system has a uh, natural frequency so when there is resonance what happens large amount of energy will be transferred from your vibration you are your finger is vibrating sticking and releasing yeah it's getting stick and release so that vibration will cause the glass to vibrate and that energy will be transferred to the glass system and there will be resonance so due to resonance large amount of energy will be transferred system will vibrate with larger amplitude so larger uh, louder sound will be heard since the energy is continuously being transferred the sound will stay for longer time that sounds that you need to give for this question Okay, question number fifteen. Uh, a nucleus of polonium two hundred and ten decays to lead two hundred and six by emitting an alpha particle. The mass of the particles are shown in the table, so it's given there in kilograms for polonium, lead, and alpha particle. A part, first part. Question number fifteen. Show that the energy released in the decay is about nine into ten to the power minus thirteen joule. So you know, in a release in a radioactive decay, we find by using mass deficit. Then mass deficit is equal to 
sorry, we find the mass deficit first, then by using E equal delta mc square, we can find the energy released. So, a part first part, we will find the first mass deficit delta m is equal to, so polonium is uh, decay, so polonium is the uh, parent nucleus, it decays into lead and alpha, so mass deficit is equal to mass of the polonium, that's the initial element, polonium decays into lead and decays into lead and alpha particle, lead PV, PV and alpha particle. So, mass deficit means here the total mass after decay will be lower than initial mass. So, mass decay means mass of polonium minus total mass after decay. So, mass of polonium minus, minus mass of PV plus mass of alpha So, the masses are given, substituted, 3.4857, uh, use all the decimal points, don't make any approximation, 10 to the power minus 25, minus mass of PV is uh, 3.41918, Ten to the power minus twenty five plus mass of alpha six point six four four three seven ten to the power minus twenty seven. Okay, so delta m will be nine point six three ten to the power minus thirty kilogram. So equal energy release equal. C square times delta M, that is 3 into 10 to the power 8 or the square. C square delta M or delta M into C square. Either way you can write delta M, but you got 9.63 10 to the power minus 30. So you will get it in joules, that will be 8.7 10 to the power minus 13. So approximately 9 into 10 to the power minus 13 joules. Okay, so A part, second part, 98% of the energy from the decay is released as kinetic energy of the alpha particles. Calculate the velocity of the alpha particle immediately after collision. So, it's nothing, find the 98% of the energy release, what we found in the A part, first part. Then half m v squared, find the v for alpha particle. So, half times mass of alpha, speed of alpha squared is equal to 98% of 8.7 10 to the power minus 38, 98% 98 over 100, that's all. So mass of alpha is given, so half into mass of alpha is given as 6.4437 10 to the power minus 27, V alpha squared is equal to 8.7 10 to the power minus 13 into 0 0.98. Find the V alpha. You will get 1.60 10 to the power 7 meter per second. Okay, so B part of question number 15, explain why not all of the energy from the decay is released as kinetic energy of the alpha particle. So you know that when the uh, polonium decays, the products are alpha and lead. Before decay, the momentum of the polonium is zero. So after decay also, the total momentum must be equal to zero. You know, uh, in unit four, we learned certain factors must be conserved. Momentum must be conserved in radiative decay. So since the momentum is conserved, so I can say momentum is conserved. Initially, polonium becomes alpha, uh, sorry, lead plus alpha. So, momentum of polonium is zero, that means momentum of PV plus momentum of alpha must be equal to zero. 
both should have the same momentum in opposite direction. That means momentum also has, sorry, uh, lead also has momentum means lead also has kinetic energy, but its mass is much higher than mass of the alpha particle. That's the reason uh, the two percent which is missing, the two percent of the energy release is carried by lead particles because they have momentum to conserve the total momentum which is equal to zero. Lead particle also carries momentum. Therefore, lead particles also have kinetic energy. That is the two percentage of the total energy released. So, ninety-eight percentage only given to the alpha particle. Okay, question number sixteen. The planets orbit the sun in approximately circular orbits. Actually, they are elliptical path, but we take it approximately circular orbits. The orbital time t of a planet is re uh, related to average distance r of the planet from the sun. A part, first part. Show that t is related to r. T is the time period of one circular orbit. R is the distance from the center of the uh, sun. Is related by t squared proportional to r cube. We need to derive this. Okay, so a part first part. When a planet orbits the sun, we assume it's moving in circular path. The required centripetal force for the circular motion of the planet is given by the gravitational pull by the Earth. So the gravitational pull by the Earth is given by g mass of the sun. Uh, times mass of the planet over r squared. This gravitational pull is going to be centripetal force m r omega squared. M is the mass of the planet. This is the mass of the sun, capital M. So m and will get cancelled. So we'll get g m over r squared. This r will come down. R two equal to omega squared. But we know that omega equal two pi over t for one circular orbit. The time taken is capital T. So we can substitute here g m over r q equal to two pi over t all things squared. So that's going to be g m over r q equal to four pi squared over t squared. So make the t squared subject cross multiply. T squared is equal to 4 pi squared, bring the gm down into r cube. You know that g is constant for a given star that is sun, m is constant, 4 pi squared is constant. So this whole quantity is constant, 4 pi squared over gm is constant. So I can say t squared equal to a constant k which is 4 pi squared over gm into r cube. That means t squared proportional to r cube. Where k is a constant 4 pi squared over gm. M is the mass of the sun. Sorry, yes, mass of the sun. Okay, question number 16, second part. It's an interesting question. When the planets align as uh, they orbit the sun, they are said to be in opposite. So that means they are on the same line. Sun, Earth, Jupiter. J, Jupiter is I use the notation J for Jupiter, E for Earth, S for Sun. So, if they come on the same line, that is called in, oppos uh, in uh, opposition. Yeah, they are using that word. When planets align as they orbit the Sun, they are said to be in opposition. So, they are in the same line. The diagram shows the Earth and Jupiter in opposition. The website states that the Earth and Jupiter are in opposition every 13 months. That means, you know, they are going to orbit in different angular speeds because their time period is different. It's given. Mean distance from the Earth to Sun is given. So the distance of the Earth from the Sun is given. Distance of the Jupiter from the Sun is given. So we know that they are going to have different time period because they are at different distances from the center of the circular orbit. Center is the Sun. So the mean distance of the Earth from the Sun is given. Mean distance of the Jupiter from the Sun is given. 
time period of the earth is given so we can find the time period of the jupiter by using the previous relationship t square proportional to r cube r cube we can find the time period of the uh, jupiter okay now what's the idea now the question is uh, the website states that earth and jupiter are in opposition every 13 months deduce whether this statement is correct okay anyway uh, first we need to find the time period of circular motion of the jupiter that is not a big problem we can use t square proportional r cube from that we can find it because uh, time period of earth is given as 12 months so we can find the time period of the jupiter it's not an issue then how are you going to show that every 13 months they will come like this but not at the same position they will be at the same position yeah they'll come like this how to show that okay now we know that the Jupiter has a larger radius of orbit means it has larger time period. Larger time period means according to omega equal 2 pi over t since the Jupiter has larger time period because larger radius r cube t square proportional to r cube we derived it. So we know the radius of orbit of the Jupiter is larger, so time period is large, so angular speed is smaller. So that means when we consider a time t later from this opposition position, later at time t, the Jupiter will evolve to smaller angle. It will rotate through smaller angle because its angular speed is smaller. So we can say late at time t, earth has come to this position, we will say at time t, this is we can take this position as time t equals 0, late at time t, earth has come to this position and it has rotated or turned through angle theta 1. The Jupiter will be somewhere here because you know angular speed is smaller, therefore the amount of rotation or yeah, rotation at the central angle will be smaller for Jupiter. So at time t, the Jupiter will be somewhere here. At time t equal t, here also time t equal t, Jupiter has rotated through angle theta 2. Okay, so it's not a big issue. If they want to become again oppos in opposition position, what's the difference? Theta 1 minus theta 2 should be either 0 theta 1 minus theta 2 should be either 0 that is happening now theta 1 minus theta 2 equals 0 at t equals 0 so later if the theta 1 minus theta 2 theta 1 minus theta 2 becomes 2 pi again they will be on the same line or if they become 4 pi again they will be in opposition or 6 pi they will be in opposition so we can say if theta 1 minus theta equal 2 and pi general format because every 13 months they are saying not after 30 months every 30 months so 2 and pi I can say where n equals 0 1 2 like whole numbers integers I take n as integers 0 1 2 so n equals 0 theta 1 equal theta 2 they will be in opposition when n equal 1 2 pi again they will be in opposition from this we can find the time t okay that's the idea so we'll do the calculation now we got the idea now what to do okay we'll use the equation t square proportional to r cube uh, t square proportional to r cube means you know t square equal to a constant k into r cube we don't need what is k for earth we know that is 24 hours so 24 uh, sorry t 12 months sorry that's the time period of uh, orbit is it so 12 months 12 square equal k into r for the earth is given radius of the earth is given 1.5 10 to the power 11 all the cube equation 1 for jupiter i can say it as t or tj or t is equal to k into the radius of orbit is given for jupiter 7.8 10 to the power 11 cube. Okay, it's nothing. So you can say this t square, sorry. So 2 over 1 from that t squared over 12 square equal k and k will get cancelled. 7.8 10 to the power 11 over 1.5 10 to the power 11 all the cube. So from this find the t, the time period of the Jupiter around the sun. So you will get t is equal to 
142.3 uh, months. So that's the time period of orbit around the sun for Jupiter. Okay, so I can see that uh, the, I need to find the theta 1, theta 2 uh, in terms of uh, in terms of time periods. So, okay, we know that omega equal 2 pi over t that is equal to theta over t angular speed equal change in central angle over time taken. So, from this we can say theta is equal to 2 pi over t times t. So, we use this one. So, theta 1 is equal to 2 pi over time period of the theta 1 is the angle turned by uh, earth. So, time period is 12 months into t. Similarly, theta 2 for Jupiter, 2 pi over 142.3 into t. So, if they want to be in opposition again, theta 1 minus theta 2 should be 2 and pi, where n equals 0, 1, 2 or 0 or 1 or 2 or 3. I, I, I can say is, is, n is a whole number. That's easy. I can say where n is a whole number. Positive whole number. So, substitute. It's of theta 1. We can substitute 2 pi over 12 t minus 2 pi over 142.3 t equal 2 and pi. So, 2 pi, 2 pi, 2 pi will get cancelled. So, t will be equal to solid. You will get t is equal to 13.1 n. That means n equal, uh, I already said n is a whole number. So, 13.1 n means it is a whole number. So, every 13 years, it will become in opposition. positive whole number. Every 13 years, they will be in opposition. That means after 13 years from this position, after 26 years from this position, after 39 years from the initial position means every 13 years. That's the meaning of it. N is an integer. Okay, so part B, question number 16. The distance of Jupiter from the sun varies from 7.4 10 to the power 11 meter to 8.2 10 to the power 11 meter. Uh, because actually uh, it's moving on an elliptical path. Calculate the change in gravitational potential energy of the Jupiter as it moves from its closest distance to its furthest distance from the Sun. Mass of the Sun is given, mass of the Jupiter also given. You know gravitational potential energy is given by minus g m m over r where r is the distance from the Sun, m is the mass of the sun, m is the, this symbol m is the mass of the Jupiter. There will be a negative sign because it's an attractive force. Always gravitational force is attractive. That's the reason gravitational potential energy will be negative. So we need to find the change in gravitational potential energy. Delta GPE is going to be minus g m m over r2 so that means this is the sun r2 is the final position far away distance r2 this is r2 that is at a distance of uh, 8.2 10 to the power 11 r1 this one 
So they are asking when it moves from 7.4 to 8.2. This is R1, which is uh, 7.4, 10 to the power 11. So minus GMMO R2 minus, minus GMM over R1. So it will become minus into minus plus. So I can take GMM outside. So GMM within bracket 1 over R1 minus 1 over R2 joules substitute 6.67 uh, 10 to the power minus 11 that's the G mass of the sun is given uh, 2 into 10 to the power 30 mass of the Jupiter that is given as uh, 1.9 10 to the power 27 1 over R1, R1 is 7.4 10 to the power 11 minus 8.2 10 to the power 11 watt. This much of joules. So solve it, you'll get the answer. So that's going to be 3.34. 10 to the power 34 joules. So, change in GP is positive means it's gaining gravitational potential energy. Question number 17. A man is about to dive into the sea from high diving boat. The boat is horizontal before he walks to the end of the boat. When the man stands on the end of the boat, it bends as shown. A photograph is given there. A part, by pushing on the board, the man displaces the end of the board a small distance downwards. The man and the boat then oscillate with approximate simple harmonic motion. A part question is state conditions for simple harmonic motion. So the first condition acceleration should be directly proportional to displacement. That's the first condition acceleration should be directly proportional to displacement. Second condition the direction of the acceleration is always towards the equilibrium position. That's the second condition. Okay B part. The man stands at the end of the board. The board is in equilibrium when the end of the board has a vertical displacement of 18 cm. Mass of the man 75 kg. B part, first part, the board obeys Hooke's law as it deforms. Show that the stiffness. Stiffness means the K. So, B part, first part. I can use the mass of the man is given, so when he stands, it deforms through a uh, amount of uh, displacement 18 centimeters. So F equal K delta X, that's a Hooke's law equation. So force is 75 into 9.81. When the man is at rest, I need to find the K. The amount of displacement is the compression or deformation in the uh, board, which is 18. Uh, centimeter so 18 into 10 to the power minus 2 find the k that will be 4088 newton per meter so approximately 4000 newton per meter second part <coughs> Calculate the frequency of oscillation of the man on the board. Ignore the mass on the board. So the period equation is given. T equal 2 pi square root of m over k. That's the natural frequency. The period when it oscillates uh, naturally. Yeah, free oscillation. So f equal 1 over t. So 1 over 2 pi square root of k over m. So substitute 1 over 2 pi. square root of k is uh, 4088 mass is 75 kilograms so the frequency will be 
टू एक्स ओके पार्ट सी क्वेश्चन नंबर सेवेंटीन पार्ट सी इफ द एम्पलीट्यूड ऑफ ऑसिलेशन इज लार्ज इनफ द मैन विल लूज कंटेक्ट विद द बोर्ड एट अ पॉइंट अबाउ द इक्विपियम पोजिशन अबाउ द इक्विपियम पोजिशन एक्सप्लेन वाई ओके सो इफ यू से दिस इज द इक्विपियम पोजिशन एंड इफ द मैन इज अबाउ द इक्विपियम पोजिशन दिस इक्विपियम पोजिशन ड्रॉ द मैन लाइक अ जस्ट पॉइंट पास सो दिस इज द इक्विपियम पोजिशन so when the man is above the equilibrium position the two forces acting on the man are the normal reaction r and the weight so the resultant force should be towards the equilibrium position or the acceleration to be towards the equilibrium position if the oscillation wants to be simple harmonic motion so the resultant force towards the equilibrium position that will be f equal towards the equilibrium position here the man is here so it should be downwards should be equal to mg Minus R equal to M A. That means M A equal M G minus R. R equal M G minus M A. Okay, we know that A equal minus omega squared x. Minus is a sign, so we can remove that when we deal with numerical values. Uh, minus sign indicates A and X are always opposite. So in uh, quantity, in the magnitude wise when we consider a equal omega square x so amplitude becomes larger means the maximum acceleration that occurs at the maximum displacement position where the displacement becomes amplitude the acceleration will be maximum so there a max equal omega square a so if i substitute that one here mg equal mg minus the r equal mg minus m omega square a Right now, look at here. Here, mg here m omega squared a. If omega squared a becomes equal to g for a particular value of a, it can happen. So, if omega squared a that is the maximum acceleration, so now I can say m a maximum acceleration or omega squared a. When a becomes larger, when a becomes larger, they are saying for a uh, man will lose contact with the boards at a point above the equilibrium position. If the amplitude of oscillation is large enough, so that means a becomes large, a that is amplitude becomes large, maximum acceleration will become large. So that means when a becomes large, this omega squared a can have a value equal to g. Then r will become equal to zero. R becomes equal to zero means there is no contact with the board. That's the answer you should say. Question number eighteen. Wolf thirty three five nine is a red dwarf star. The distance of the star from Earth was first determined from parallax measurements made by the astronomer Max Wolf. A part first part. The parallax angle was two point zero one ten to the power minus six radians. Very small angle. Calculate the distance in meters uh, of Wolf. Three five nine from the Earth. Mean distance from Earth to Sun is given, right? So it's like uh, this is the. So Earth is orbit. This is the Sun. So Earth is orbiting the Sun. So here is the Earth. So the distance. Uh, this parallax angle is given. This angle is given. That is two point zero one ten to the power minus six radians. Radians. So we need to find this length also given. The distance of the Earth from the Sun is given, which is one point five zero ten to the power eleven. So we need to find uh, this distance. So this is the star. We need to find uh, 
calculate the distance in meters from Earth. So we need to find this distance d. Okay, so we know that for small angle sine theta is almost equal to tan theta. That is equal to t time radians. So we know that for small angles sine theta approximately equal to tan theta which is equal to theta in radian. Okay, so here we need to find this distance. This is given. So I can use sine theta or tan theta. So if the question is they asked to find the distance in meters from the earth. So this one. So sine theta that is almost equal to theta. Sine theta means opposite 1.50 10 to the power 11 over d is equal to t time radians. t time radians 2.01 10 to the power minus 6 radians. So find the d. Solve it. You will get the answer. That is 1.50 10 to the power 11 divided by 2.01 10 to the power minus 6. So don't convert uh, radians into a degree. So sine theta approximately equal to tan theta equal to theta. You can use that one. So you will get tan theta not necessary. Sine theta equal to theta uh, in radians. So you will find 7.46 10 to the power 16 meters. That's the answer for question number 18. A part. First part. A part, second part, two mark question, explain why parallax measurements can only be used to determine the distances to a relatively small number of stars. So you can see that when the distance of the star becomes larger, the parallax angle will become smaller. When the parallax angle becomes smaller, the measurement will be difficult because the angle can become smaller than the precision of the measuring instrument. Therefore, smaller angles cannot be measured and there will be larger percentage uncertainty in the measurement. Again, I am telling it, when the distance of a star becomes larger or when we try to measure the far distant stars, the parallax angle will become smaller. You know that when this star somewhere here means, say this is the star, if the star is somewhere here, this angle will become smaller, the parallax angle will become smaller. When the parallax angle becomes smaller, it could become smaller than the precision of the measuring instrument. Therefore, there will be larger percentage uncertainty in the measurement of the angle. Question number 18b part. The graph shows how the intensity of radiation from the star varies with wavelength. Show that the surface temperature, so just nothing, Wien's law, use it, everyone can do that. B part, first part, Wien's law, lambda max into T equal the Wien's constant 2.898 10 to the power minus 3. So from the graph, find the wavelength that correspond to the peak intensity. That will be uh, equal to 1.075. 10 to the power minus 6 because micrometer. So from the graph, find the from the graph. This is the graph given. Find the value of lambda for this peak intensity. So that is 1.075 micrometer. So 10 to the power minus 6 into T equal 2.898 10 to the power minus 3. So find the T in Kelvin. That will be 2000. 695 Kelvin, so approximately 2700 Kelvin. Okay, question number 18, big part, second part. The radius of the sun, R sun, uh, is defined as R sun. The radius of the wolf 359 is 0 0.16 times of radius of the sun. It is claimed that the luminosity of the wolf 359 is less than 0.1 percentage of the luminosity of the sun, L sun. They are saying it. The given quantity is radius of the sun is given, luminosity of the sun is given, temperature T, that is the temperature of the uh, 2700 Kelvin. Uh, 
temperature of the wolf 359 also given as 2700 Kelvin already we found it but they are giving it again okay so the equation to find the luminosity is uh, Stefan Boltzmann law L equal sigma A t to the power 4 and we know that area equal 4 pi r square for a sphere for a star we assume it has a spherical shape so we can say for uh, Yes, uh, for the wolf 359, I can say LW is equal to uh, sigma 5.67 into 10 to the power minus 8. That's the value of sigma. Area is equal to 4 pi r squared. The radius is actually uh, given as uh, 0.16 of the radius of the sun but the radius of the sun is given as 6.96 10 to the power 8 so 0.16 time radius of the sun 6.96 10 to the power 8 all the squared 4 pi r squared into t to the power 4 2700 to the power 4 so the luminosity of the star wolf 359 is given as will be 4.70 10 to the power 23 watts per meter squared. So we need to show this luminosity is just less than 0.1% per, of the luminosity of the sun. So L wolf star over L sun that is 4.70 10 to the power 23 over luminosity of the sun is given 3.83 3.83 10 to the power 26 in percentage 100 percent so that will be 0 0.122 percentage so this is actually we can say it's almost equal or slightly greater than 0 0.1 the luminosity of Question number 19, the spectrum of light emitted by the star uh, provides an evidence of mercury atoms in the outer layers of the star. The light emitted from the star is compared with the light emitted from the mercury lamp on earth. The lamp contains 1.65 10 to the power 19 mercury atoms in a volume of 1.50 10 to the power minus 5 meter cube. Pressure of the mercury vapor 4.25 10 to the power 4. Calculate the mean kinetic energy of the mercury atoms. Okay, so that's the question 19 A part. So we know that PV equal NKT from that find the temperature. So PV equal NKT. That's the question number 19 A part. So pressure we know that 4.25 10 to the power 4. The number of molecules given as uh, uh, 1.65 uh, Yeah, volume is given as 1.50 10 to the power uh, minus 5 equal in kt n is given as 1.65 10 to the power 19, Boltzmann constant is K 1.38, 10 to the power minus 23 into T, find the T, so that will be in Kelvin, that will be 2799 
Kelvin. Approximately, you can take 2800 Kelvin. Right, so the average kinetic energy of the mercury atom, so half m v square, half m c square is the average kinetic energy of the molecule. So that will be 3 by 2 kT. So this you can take 2800 Kelvin. So 3 by 2 kT, so that is 3 by 2 k 1.38 then the power minus 23 into 2800 joules. So the answer will be 5.80 10 to the power minus 20 joules. So big part one line in the spectrum of light from uh, Chi Lupi has a wavelength of 576.933 nanometer. The equivalent line in the mercury spectrum produced on Earth, 576, the laboratory thing, uh, 959 nanometer. A student concluded from this data that the star is moving towards the Earth and that the relative velocity, 1400 meter per second, deduced whether the student's conclusion are correct. So we know that I call it Doppler effect equation, Doppler effect. Delta lambda over lambda equal V over C. So delta lambda means change in wavelength, that is the difference between actual wavelength and the apparent wavelength. So that will be 576.959 we can keep it in nanometer because numerator and denominator both we are going to keep it in nanometer. Your delta lambda is the difference between the apparent wavelength and the actual wavelength. Lambda is the actual wavelength. That means the wavelength measured in the laboratory that is 576.959. <coughs> so this is uh, minus 576.933. Nine five nine equal v over c three into ten to the power eight find the v v is equal to one point three five ten to the power four so that is one thirteen thousand five hundred meter per second which is greater than one thousand four hundred meter per second so in current conclusion. But he is saying that uh, the, the, the student concluded from that the moving towards, moving towards means the wavelength is decreasing compared to actual wavelength. The apparent wavelength is uh, 933, 576, 933. That is correct. It's moving towards is a correct statement because the apparent wavelength is smaller, but the velocity is wrong. Correct value for the velocity. Okay, part C the surface temperature of this star is twice the surface temperature of the sun. The radius is three times the radius of the sun. So, you know, I call it L equals sigma t to the power 4. Temperature becomes double and radius becomes three times means the luminosity will be much higher. So higher temperature, higher luminosity means it should be a main sequence star. On the main sequence, it should be on the left of the sun at higher position. So you can say it should be on the left of the sun on the main sequence. It should be on the left side of the sun. In HR diagram, you know that in HR diagram, this is the temperature, this is the relative luminosity, temperature decreases high to low. So here Earth, the sun is somewhere around 5600, so it's double the temperature and higher luminosity somewhere here on the left and upper position.
Okay, question number 20 this is about dropping molten lead. To avoid producing steam, the temperature of lead sphere was below 100 degrees Celsius as it reached the cold water. A part, first part, lead sphere falls through a distance of 41.5 meters. Show that about 3 seconds for the lead sphere to fall through the distance. So that's nothing as equal to ut plus half a t square. So 41.5 meters dropped from rest half into 9.81 t squared by the t that will be 2.91 second approximately 3 seconds. Okay, so the lead sphere has a radius of 1.2 millimeter. As it falls, it cools from 615 Kelvin. So it cools from 615 Kelvin to 370 Kelvin. The molten lead solidifies at 601 Kelvin. So somewhere here, it, 615 to 617, it's cooling when it falls, but it solidifies at temperature of uh, 601 Kelvin. That means here it is in the liquid state, here only it is becoming solid. So when it falls, at the moment it starts to fall, it will be in the form of liquid at temperature 615 Kelvin. When it becomes 601 Kelvin, it loses heat to the surrounding. When it is in the liquid format, it becomes solid. Then it loses heat until 370 uh, Kelvin. So calculate the mean rate at which energy is transferred from the lead sphere to the surroundings. You should assume that the specific heat capacities of liquid lead and solid lead are the same. Density of the lead is given. Specific latent heat, that means specific latent heat means with the specific latent heat of uh, fusion, that is when the liquid becomes solid, you know the heat release equal to delta M into L, so that L is given. Specific heat capacity of the lead, that is same for solid and liquid, specific capacity is the same, they are saying. So we need to find the power, calculate the mean rate at which energy is transferred, energy transferred per unit time average. So we know that the time taken. So here, when it falls through that particular distance, the heat it loses due to three different reasons. So total heat, I can say total heat lost by lead sphere. First, it will lose when it is in the liquid format. So it is in the liquid format until its temperature drops to uh, 601 Kelvin, it will be in liquid state. After it reaches 601 only, it's going to be state change. It's going to be solidified. It's going to happen state change. Until it reaches 601 Kelvin, it will be in the liquid format. So I can say mass of the liquid drop into specific capacity of liquid into delta T. The delta T will be from 615 to uh, 601, it's in the liquid state. Now what's going to happen? It's going to lose heat during solidification. So it's going to state change going to happen. So that is mass of the uh, mass of the uh, sphere into late of uh, later heat of fusion. State change is going to happen. Now it has become solid. Then mass of solid into specific capacity of the solid sphere into delta T, 2 I will put here, delta T, 1 I will put it. Okay, so the mass is the same. All masses are same because it's the uh, same sphere. So I will put it as M. M is the same for all throughout the process. We know that M is equal to 4 by 3 pi R. Q. Okay, so we, I can take the M out, M that is 4 by 3 pi R cube into Cl delta T1 plus 
uh, L F let it diffuse and when the state change occurs plus C solid delta T to okay that is mass I can say 4 by 3 pi the radius is given as uh, uh, 1.2 millimeters so convert to 1.2 10 to the power minus 3 or the squared cube sorry cube 4 by 3 pi r cube into specific heater capacity of liquid state and solid state are same in the question they are same which is given as 130 so 130 times delta t1 is from 100, 650 to 601 it's in the liquid state plus later heat of fusion that is given uh, to 2.47 10 to the power 4 then this is same as the liquid that is uh, 130 130 into the delta T2 it is at 601 at the end of the solid uh, phase change that is 601 minus the final temperature is 370 So solve it, the total energy, we will get it as six, 4.63 joules. So rate of energy transfer, rate of energy transfer or rate of heat loss Yeah, rate of energy transfer, they are saying energy, yeah. Four point six three joules divided by the time taken to fall down that is uh, two point nine one. So you will get it one point six zero joule per second. That's the final answer. Okay, the part B, question number 20. A teacher demonstrates a mechanical method to demonstrate specific capacity of lead. Some lead shot at room temperature is placed in a perspex cube. So there's a diagram given with the lead shots. The teacher turns the cube upside down and the lead shot falls through the distance D. The teacher repeats this N times, capital N times, and measures the final temperature of the lead shot. The change in temperature delta T of the lead shot is calculated. The teacher uses the values of D, N and delta T to determine the value for the specific capacity C of the lead. So the D is the distance it's followed. Uh, is D. Yeah. So first part, B part, first part, explain why the mass of lead shot in the tube should not affect the delta T. So we know that here when you turn the cube upside down, the lead shots are going to fall, so they are going to get heat, the kinetic energy or loss in GP will become kinetic energy, kinetic energy will become internal energy. So here the equation we are going to use loss in JPA equal increase in internal energy or gain in heat energy, gain in heat. So loss in GP MGH for the whole, it is the total mass of the uh, lead spheres. Gaining heat of the spheres, Mc delta T, delta T. So here, T will get cancelled. So sorry, the M will get cancelled. And delta T, or the specific capacity C, does not depend on M because M will get cancelled. Loss in GP is the gain in heat or gain in internal energy of the lead spheres. They fall down when you are turning. The loss in GP is going to be internal energy. So 
the second part is the B part first part B part second part <coughs> Assess whether this method would produce an accurate value for the C. So we can say here not all the energy transferred from GTE will not be absorbed by the uh, lead spots because there will be heat loss to surrounding and also the amount of increase in uh, temperature will be very small and there could be large uncertainty in the measurement of delta theta. So we can say again, I'll tell the answer, not all the heat will be used to increase the internal energy uh, of the lead sphere. Some energy loss in GP could be transferred to other formats such as sound. Uh, so, and also the increase in delta theta will be very small. So percentage uncertainty in the measurement of C is going to be very large. So that's the answer for the last part of this paper. Okay, so I hope you understood uh, the whole questions, uh, answers for the whole questions. Uh, anyway, so I'll discuss the other papers uh, one by one later. Bye.